out there, so I'll hide while I do what I need to do. Or to kill. Hey, I'm hungry and I want to eat. So, you think this guy needs stealth? No, he's the biggest, baddest dude out there. And, uh, I mean, he can even chase away the number one predator in the uh, Serengeti by just his size and his strength. Well, nature uses stealth. And uh, natural camouflage <clears throat> in the animal kingdom is, is common. Uh, here's an owl sitting in the crook of a tree. Uh, here's this uh, cat. He wants to eat, and he's on the hunt, so he's sneaking around, stealthy, very quiet, very slow, very methodical. How about this guy on the ocean floor? Can you see him down there? He's stealthy, waiting for something to swim by so he can snag some lunch. Even uh, not just uh, in the visual area, in the sound as well. Owls have little tiny micro feathers on the end of their big feathers that quiet the airflow to make them very quiet so that the prey cannot hear them swooping in for the kill. How about this guy? He's a, uh, an insect. There's his head, his legs. And uh, also, you need to know your enemy. You know, if, if you are trying to defend yourself against a uh, high order predator, um, you need to know what that predator can do or what your adversary can do. So a lone zebra here looks pretty, uh, pretty obvious, doesn't it? Just black and white stripes against the green grass. Well, here's his uh, enemy. This, uh, this guy is the one that he's trying to defend against, but we know some things about this guy, right? He's colorblind. He can only see in black and white. Also, he needs to identify one single target so that he can plan his attack. So our single zebra standing by himself, black and white standing out, how about this? It's totally confusing to the uh, predator that the zebra is defending against. And uh, I've actually seen this myself in the, in the uh, Serengeti where you cannot even count the number of zebras that are there. Now, for uh, military aspects, uh, stealth has to do with what you're using to find the uh, adversary or the other individual. What you see here is some uh, visual camouflage. Then if we change that camouflage and we look at it for uh, night vision systems or uh, thermally using infrared, you can see where one guy really stands out and the other one is still, uh, still hidden. So you need to know what the, uh, the enemy is using to try to find you. <clears throat> what about if you live in total darkness? You know, you got that little light there. Hey, what's this light? Oh my goodness, it's, a, it's attached to a, uh, a predatory fish and he's using that little light uh, as, a, uh, as a lure in order to get him folks close enough to where he can uh, have a nice little meal and they wouldn't see him in the dark. Part of the art of stealth is looking like your background. This is a ship that Lockheed built called the Sea Shadow. And it was a stealth ship. Uh, they didn't buy uh, any more than just this one as a uh, test vehicle. But when they first tested it, if you look in the upper left, you can see uh, a blank spot in the radar, sc radar screen. The ocean itself has a uh, bit of a radar return. So they, what they found was they could track the ship by seeing where there was no sea reflection. So they actually had to put some stuff on the ship to make it a little noisier, make it a little less stealthy so it looked like the ocean and would blend in. <clears throat> now, why would we have stealth on airplanes? Well, to survive, right? Missiles are very, very dangerous. They're getting very effective. And I, I think I'm going to just hide from them so they can't find me. Another thing is to kill, right? They won't see me coming so I can do my job. And my job is to go in there and break stuff in bad guy land. So what about stealth airplanes? <clears throat> Here's basic radar theory that you need to know to understand stealth. On the right, we have the bad guy radar. He sends out a, uh, an electromagnetic pulse, a pulse of energy, and it hits the good guy airplane and when that energy is reflected back to the radar that sent it out, there's a blip on the screen. 
Now, what we do with a uh, stealth airplane is we shape the airplane such that when that energy from the bad guy radar hits the airplane, it doesn't return back to the emitting radar. It is bounced up into space or away from it somewhere like that. So if there's no return echo, the uh, bad guy radar can't see the airplane. So what we do is we measure the, uh, the echo that is emitted by the airplane. So we take a radar, we know exactly how much power it puts out, we bounce it off the airplane, and we uh, measure how strong the power is that is uh, received back, the echo. And we also turn the airplane around so that we measure all the different angles around the airplane where the reflection is strong and where it's weak. So here's an example. Uh, if you can see inside here, uh, we call this a fuzzball, all right? The length of these spikes that, from the center is the strength of the radar reflection coming off that airplane. Now, I've put in here a, a silhouette of an F-15. You can see it kind of buried inside those spikes. Trust me, this is not the radar cross-section or radar return of an F-15. This is actually the radar return of a Jeep Cherokee. We put it uh, in the uh, modeling software, and this is what came out. But if you notice, out the front and out the back and out the left and out the right are very strong radar reflections. And there's a continuum of radar reflections all the way around it. <clears throat> so um, a radar... Uh, has a certain sensitivity. There's internal noise, uh, the electricity that's used to power the thing. Each little uh, transistor or vacuum tube or whatever has noise in it. So the radar return has to have a certain strength for the radar itself to be able to figure out, oh, this is, a, this is another airplane and I need to put a blip on the scope. All right, so I've uh, kind of put this uh, circle in the middle where I call it radar sensitivity. So any of those spikes that are longer, that, that uh, radiate further outside that circle are strong enough for the radar to see and determine that that is a echo and display it on the screen. Now, if we take an airplane and we make a stealth shape out of it, if you can see in the middle, I've got something resembling the F-117, again, this is the same Jeep Cherokee, but we put flat sides on it, made it kind of look like an F-117 or look like that sea shadow. And what it did was uh, <clears throat> controlled the radar reflections. Now, if you notice where on the previous slide, see all the hundreds of spikes coming off the airplane. the airplane to do with the computing power that was available when the airplane was designed. It's easier to model a, a uh, finite number of flat surfaces than it is to model a curve, which is essentially an infinite number of surfaces. Um, as technology, computer technology has improved, uh, we're able to make airplanes that are, uh, that look more like airplanes and uh, are a little more kind to the air than the F-117. So here's the front view. There's the bottom of the airplane. Notice it's very flat and it's designed to reflect that radar energy away from the enemy radar. Here's the back of the airplane. 
something very important to notice is you can't see the exhaust of the engine. The exhaust is hidden, so uh, for uh, heat-seeking missiles and uh, ground detection using infrared equipment, uh, so the airplane uh, is stealthy not only for radar, but infrared as well. And here's the front of the airplane. This uh, area down at the bottom, you can see kind of a globe inside of it and it's shaped like home plate. That is the infrared acquisition and detection system. And it, uh, it's an infrared system that sits behind that screen and that screen is also designed to keep radar energy away. Also notice the sawtooth uh, linings to the canopy and the, uh, the screen itself. Again, we're reflecting that radar energy away from the adversary. Now, what about this beautiful airplane? Nice and smooth and, and uh, very sleek, very aerodynamic. It utilizes the same principles. This is the F-22 and there's the leading edge of the canopy, leading edge of the intake. There's the trailing edge of the canopy, leading edge of the wing horizontal tail. Now you're starting to see a, uh, a system of parallel lines, again, that are designed to reflect the radar energy away from the airplane. There's the uh, wingtip. Now here's the front of the airplane, and you can see the same principles apply if you let, look at the, uh, the intakes, the, the fuselage nose, uh, the vertical tails, etc. So we're controlling our radar reflection. That's the science of stealth. It's uh, short and simple, but uh, trust me, it's a very complex science when you get into it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Jim Brown, thank you for being here today. Uh, would you introduce yourself, please, to our junior test pilots? Hi gang, my name is Jim Brown. Uh, I'm a test pilot. I tested uh, fighter airplanes, mainly the F-15, the F-117, F-16, and the F-22. How do you want to do this? The, you know, both of them, uh, you know, people, fighter guys don't think the F-117 is very maneuverable, but it actually was. Um, it performed better than the, uh, say, the P-51, the F-86, the earlier, uh, earlier fighters. Uh, the big problem was the shape of the wings. You know, it's got that really swept wing. And that makes, when you maneuver hard, that makes a lot of drag. And the uh, drag is what you need big engines to overcome. And it could make one really good, very maneuverable turn, but then it was out of airspeed. And uh, you had to spend some time speeding back up. Whereas the F-22, big monster engines, and it could continue to maneuver and maneuver uh, until you ran out of gas. I saw a hand up. No hands, okay. Um, so, uh, so you talked about the shape of the wings and all of that stuff. That's very important. The, uh, when you're maneuvering the airplane, when fighter guys are talking about this, uh, you're talking about G-force as well. And that's basically how strong the, uh, somebody just put up a picture of the F-117. Uh, the the, how strong the wings are on the airplane. Uh, some airplanes, like an airliner, they can only go to about three times the force of, force of gravity or three Gs before things start bending and breaking. Whereas the, uh, the F-117 was designed for seven Gs and the F-22 for nine Gs. Um, to show you how strong the wings on the F-22 are, the, uh, y'all know that, you know, the semi-tractor trailer trucks on the highway, you could stack seven semi-tractor trailer trucks absolutely full on top of an F-117 and the wings would hold it. All right, and Nicole wanted to know, what are the biggest airplanes you have flown? The biggest airplane I've actually flown is the, 
probably the C-141 as an Air Force cargo plane or the KC-135. Um, they're probably the biggest. I've flown the 747 simulator. Um, and I've got, uh, I don't know, 1,200 hours of flying the 737 airliner. Those are the big ones. So you've flown these heavy jets, and then you've flown the most maneuverable fighter jet on the planet. What does, what, what does it feel like? What, what are you, the kids, our students this week learned a lot about controls and how you have, paying attention to the controls and what they mean and how you control an airplane. Um, you know, when you, when you, uh, the big airplanes fly like big airplanes. They're not that maneuverable and agile. And when you have to move the controls a lot, there's a lot of force. Um, some of that force is there to keep you from maneuvering it too much so you wouldn't break the airplane. Um, you know, and it's a subconscious thing. You know, if an airplane, when you get in it and you fly it and it's uh, kind of slow and doesn't maneuver very well, you, you learn very quickly to slow down yourself, slow down your thinking when you fly it, uh, not as aggressively as you would as an airplane that's extremely maneuverable. I got to tell you, the, uh, the F-22, when I first flew it, you know, my very first flight, I taxied out to the runway and it taxied like a truck. It felt like an old lady you know, was shrieking and groaning and making these noise. And I'm going, is this really a fighter? But I got to tell you, the second the airplane went into the air, it was very nimble, very maneuverable. And you go, uh-huh, yeah, baby, this is it. I have a question from Sunand. Sunand, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, are you a pilot or a test pilot? I'm a test pilot, which is a specific type of pilot. So all, all test pilots are pilots, but not all pilots are test pilots. Does that make sense? It's special, it's special education and training. So yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about what, how, why a test pilot and what type of training a test pilot gets and why? Sure, sure. The difference between a test pilot and an ordinary, let's call them ordinary pilots, is that test pilots have been trained in the engineering of the airplanes. We have uh, special classes on uh, you know, how you build the airplanes, the structure, how strong they are, the science and the physics of why an airplane does what it does. Um, Whereas normal pilots, they, they have an idea of the physics and stuff, but they're not down into the math and the engineering part of it. Uh, also, a very important part of test pilots is the ability to bring back information, the ability to report on what, what you found. You, know, you go up and you do a test, and you find something wrong with the airplane. Well, if you don't tell anybody about it, the airplane will never get fixed. So it's the ability to observe what's going on and bring back the information. Okay, Sinan? That's a good thing. Okay, so Sophie Nguyen, she wanted to know, has the F-117 ever broken the sound barrier? Uh, Sophie, no, and that's a very good question. The uh, the F-117, uh, the maximum allowed speed, you know, the one in the book said pilots don't go faster, is nine-tenths the, the sound. Um, if you do the math, uh, the airplane just doesn't have the thrust. It's, you know, it's not a very smooth-looking airplane. You know, it's got those flat sides on it. So it doesn't go through the air as smooth as others do. And uh, you just can't, cannot get it to go supersonic. If you did get it to go supersonic, y'all see those four little things sticking out the front? Those are the uh, pitot booms. They tell the air airplane everything it needs to know as far as how fast it is, how high it is, and very importantly, it tells the flight controls which direction to go where and all of that stuff. If you ever put, if you went supersonic, you'd have a shock wave on the, on the tip of that uh, pitot boom, and that would make that information 
uh, poor, invalid, and the, the airplane would go out of control. Do you all remember when um, Danny and Ms. Lana talked about the SR-71 and the A-12, how the sensors are on the nose? So that's, that is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Brown, that that is how all airplanes work, correct? The sensors are on the nose and they detect speed, temperature, altitude, and they affect, correct? Yes. Uh Let's not say on the nose, but in the front anyway. Okay. So does anybody think this is a funny looking airplane? No? Yes. It is it was one of um the first stealthy bombers, right? It has 90 degree angles so we can reflect radar radar in a different way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it, here's a fun fact. So um a lot of the fighter fighter pilots would fly this airplane. So they called it a fighter, but it actually didn't have the weaponry that would make it a fighter, but it handled like a fighter, right, JB? Yep, yep. The reason it's called a fighter had to do with a treaty we have with the Russians. And uh, it limited us to uh, a, a number of bombers. And we couldn't call it a bomber because then we'd have too many and that would break the treaty. So we called it a fighter. Cody, did you have a question? Um, and it went, it went subsonic because one reason is the sonic boom would give away its position and it's also, also it's most, um, it also flies not as fast as speed of sound because it is actually slow. Yes. Another reason is have you ever seen the invisible man run? He doesn't need to. He can walk in, do what he needs to do, and walk out. So that's what we were talking about, our reconnaissance planes, our spy planes that are at Blackbird Air Park. Um, the SR-71 flew so high and so fast, and it, it was designed to be stealthy, but it wasn't truly completely stealthy, but it didn't need to be because it was so high and so fast. All right, we have more questions. Um, Dean Farmer wants to know, have you ever gone past Mach 1? Yes, uh, when I was flying the F-22, we used to fly around faster than Mach 1 all the time. It was very routine. And uh, re you really couldn't tell you're going faster than the speed of sound unless you looked at the, uh, the airspeed indicator. Um, the fastest I've been has been 2.2 times the speed of sound. All right, so Cody had the question. Um, I read that you did a lot of emergency landing while testing at the F-22. Did you ever have to activate your ejector seat? No. Uh, very luckily, uh, the, uh, the emergencies I had, the problems I had airborne were, uh, were such that I was able to bring the airplane home and land. Um, thought about it once. Uh, and one other uh, pretty bad emergency, I was ready if one more thing had gone wrong, I was going to have to eject and I was ready to go. I'd already made the decision that if this happens, I'm pulling the handle. I'm not going to wait. But uh, it didn't happen, so I was able to land. So do you want to talk a little bit about the physics of when you eject and what happens to a human body when it ejects into... Um, sure, sure. Uh, First of all, you guys got to realize that ejection is not a fun thing. You have one choice, so you, or two, one choice, and that is either to eject or die, right? We don't want to die, so then you, you eject. But ejection is quite a violent thing when it happens because there's explosions and rockets, sometimes uh, shattered, uh, shattered pieces of the canopy flying around. So uh, most of the time, uh, people are injured in some way, shape, or form when they eject. Uh, so let's, let's go through the sequence, okay? You make the decision, all right, I'm going to eject. So you pull the handle or uh, whatever activation mechanism there is, 
that starts a chain of uh, events. And the first thing is you got to get rid of the canopy, right? You can't stay inside the airplane. So a lot of airplanes, the canopy itself flies off of the airplane. Uh, some airplanes, um, they have explosive uh, lines up in the canopy that shatters the canopy. So it's out of the way. Uh, other ejection seats just have a knife on the top and the knife gets to the canopy before your head does and it breaks the canopy and you go through. So different techniques there. So we got to get rid of that glass that's over our head, right? While that's happening, um, there are some other things that happen. Some airplanes, the shoulder harness will pull you back into the seat. Some airplanes will have uh, things that will capture your arms and legs because once you're up in the wind, you know, you're inside the airplane, you're not feeling any wind. And the second you eject, you could have three, 400 miles an hour of wind in your face, which would cause arms and legs to, you know, wriggle around. You've all stuck your hands outside the window of a car, right? And you felt, the, felt it moving your hand around, well, that type of stuff. Uh, so there's some uh, stuff that's done to trap the body into the seat so you don't get injured. And then uh, there's either a, uh, an explosive charge or a rocket motor that li lights off, and that's what sends the, uh, the seat out of the airplane. It's on some rails, so it's guided out. And uh, once you get outside the airplane, now uh, we got to worry about getting a parachute, don't we? Uh, some, uh, some seats uh, you will... Uh, come out of the ejection seat itself, the lap belt, the uh, shoulder harness, and the seat belt will automatically disconnect and it'll push you away from the seat. Uh, other airplanes, you'll stay in the seat for a while. As the seat slows down, you go into lower altitude. Uh, but at some point in time, you gotta get away from the seat and then the parachute will open. Almost all of them uh, have an automatic opening somewhere around 13,000 feet. So if you're above 13,000 feet, you do the parachute thing, and when you get to 13,000, the parachute opens. Uh, if you're below 13,000, when you eject, the parachute will come out right away. Um, and almost all ejection seats uh, assume that when you pull a handle, at that point, you're unconscious. So all of this other stuff happens automatically. Uh, so typically, if, if, let's say we're below 13,000 feet, you should be able to, after a few seconds, have a parachute over your head and look down and you'll have a survival kit hanging underneath you below that and inflated life raft hanging down there below that. And then it's just a matter of parachuting down and hoping you don't uh, break a leg or something when you hit the ground. things very very secret all right Kaylee do you want to ask your question or do you want me to I'm gonna try and navigate yeah I'll you. ask my question okay Hi, Kaylee. Um, what did you learn in school that helped you the most while flying planes math math and the magic number six you know, it seems a little weird. What's the magic about six? Well, there's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. There, uh, when you're navigating, there's 60 minutes in one degree of uh, latitude or longitude. So you, you do a lot of multiplying and dividing by six. All right, Andrew is on the call, but I think he would like for me to ask the question. Unless, Andrew, you'd like to pop in, you can. So Andrew sent in the question, um, what subjects do you advise to take? Math and science, I think uh, in, its, in its own right, uh, aviation is uh, a scientific endeavor. Uh, how the airplanes are put together, how they operate, how they fly, uh, that's all math and science. Ah, but I distinctly recall taking you to University of California at Santa Barbara and you giving a, a talk to the students I was working with there about the importance of writing. 
That's true. If you don't know the math and science, you don't have anything to write about. Good point. But and how it, how important it is. Why don't you talk to the kids about how much of your day you spend writing? I spend a lot of my day writing. Uh, and I'm not saying that the importance of communication is not very high. Uh, but, you know, you could go to art class and not learn anything on why or how an airplane flies or how to fly it. Uh, that's my point. Now, I know. I'm just saying. Be able to communicate and, and writing is a very important part of communication. And it's not uh, using the uh, LOL, uh, ROFL uh, type of abbreviations that you do online. It's you got to enunciate. I know. I just wanted to emphasize that the writing skills are very important. I know that I, Austin was talking about how 1% of his job is a blast. And then 99% of his job is a lot of work and a lot of reading and a lot of writing. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have some more questions. Mayon wanted to know, were there any jobs you wanted to do before you decided to be a test pilot? You know, when I was a little guy, I wanted to be a garbage man. Because I'd, I'd see them around the neighborhood, they'd be hanging on the outside of the truck and riding around hanging on the truck. I thought that'd be kind of fun to do. But uh, I decided, no, I think flying airplanes. Flying airplanes is pretty much the only thing I've ever wanted to do. I uh, wanted to be an astronaut. And how do you become an astronaut? Well, you got to be a pilot, test pilot. You know, you got to work your way down that road. And so that's kind of the way I pointed myself. Um, and we're having some questions come in from Nicole. She wants to know, um, what did you study in school to fly airplanes? Uh, Nicole, I uh, studied engineering in school. I was a civil engineer in college, which is uh, building bridges and roads and water systems and things like that. You go, well, what does that have to do with flying airplanes? Well, if you think about it, the wings of an airplane are very much like a bridge. Right, they got to hold up so much weight and uh, and uh, put up with the forces and things like that. So there's there's a good crossover. Now you don't have to study engineering to be a pilot. You do have to study engineering to be a test pilot, but uh, to fly airplanes, you don't need engineering at all. So you can study anything you like. I think the important thing is stay in school and get your education. That's the important thing. Anna Collins would like to know, what was your greatest challenge and how did you overcome it? That is an excellent question. Um, I think my greatest challenge was uh, dealing with people that did not believe in me. They did not think that I had the uh, the intelligence, the education, the skill, or whatever it was to uh, to meet my goals, and uh, you know you have to kind of uh, work hard in the face of that and show them that no, you don't know me, you don't know my goals, and uh, I'm going to prove different to you, and that that was a uh, that was a big challenge. I was very lucky as my mom and dad always uh, told me that, uh, hey, whatever you put your mind to do, you can get it done. And I believed in that and it's worked very well. That has been a common theme from just about everyone that we have spoken to. Um, we have heard stories of being rejected from test pilot school. We've heard stories about being rejected from the astronaut program and to not give up, to just keep trying to reach your goals. I think that's a really, really important lesson for all of us. It's very easy for people to say no, and it's a lot harder for them to say yes. And a lot of times you just have to prove it. All right. Okay. Uh, I just 
Hi, I'm Caitlin Mendez, and this is Kathleen Mendez. We are with the Antelope Valley Union High School District, and today we're going to be talking to you guys about preparing for a career in STEM. The both of I, the both of us, are pupil service technicians, and we are not related in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what is STEM? Throughout this conference, I'm sure you guys keep hearing the word STEM. I'm going to talk about it a lot within the slides. Um, so just to kind of cover what is STEM. So the S stands for science, T stands for technology, the E is for engineering, mm -hmm. and the M is for mathematics. Um, what does that mean to you guys in the classrooms? So STEM education is simply providing students and teachers with a stronger grasp of science, technology, engineering, and math. And they do this through hands-on skills as well as instruction in the classroom, and it connects with the real-world applications. Whoop, whoop. Okay, so these, this is a list um, on the slides of some of the sectors that we go over. Um, so it's STEM at your fingertips within your high school. So all of the different high schools are going to offer these programs within California. So California has 15 main sectors that they focus on. And um, depending on where you go to high school and what your location is, they're going to be a little bit more um, in depth with that. So for us, we focus a little bit more on engineering. There's a lot of engineering out here in the Antelope Valley. Uh, we have Lockheed, we have Northrop, um, we have the Edwards Air Force Base. Um, so we focus a little bit more on that. And it's growing with medical out here as well, including our biomed and then also the medical programs that we have at some of our high schools as well. Yes, so a lot of med as well. Okay. Okay, so these are the 15 industry sectors that I was kind of touching on. Um, so the state of California is actually responsible for picking the main industry sectors, and then that way our kids are preparing to move into the same direction that the economy is going through. Um, I don't know, some of you guys, it might be kind of hard for them to see it, but just to go over some of them, there's engineering and architecture, there's agriculture, there's public services. So within the schools, um, they might have like a fire tech program or a police academy. Um, there's arts and media and entertainment. There is health and science, um, medical technology. So within Burbank and then as well as Universal City, there's all of the time or the <coughs> Warner Brothers. Or yes studios and stuff like that out there, so some of the schools might focus a little bit more on that. If you were to be out of state, they're going to focus on a little bit more different sectors. Maybe there's farming if you're in Ohio or something like that. Um, and then the transportation in Los Angeles, Angeles. Unified School and District. New York City. So LAX is out there, and there's going to be a lot of focus on that as well. Okay. And then what are academies and pathways? So pretty much everything that we're discussing with you guys in relation to STEM um, are the high school programs that they offer to help you guys um, be able to see what it is that's available to you. Academies are going to be a specific sector that you're interested in. So let's say you're like, I want to be a nurse when I grow up. Well, that's great, but you can't stand blood or you wouldn't be able to deal with somebody throwing <laughs> up on you. So this gives you hands-on experience. You're able to um, get internships at the different doctor's offices, maybe the hospitals, yes. and then you're able to make a knowledgeable decision on what you really would like to do um, when you graduate high school. So. Is We're my... moving to the next slide. <laughs> I did do and it. then finding your path as well. So the, the academy students, they get the ability <laughs> to tour different colleges um, that are available to them. And um, again, the work-based learning students get to work with industry partners. So you get hands-on experience with potential future employers. And STEM and CTE, the way that both of these connect, overall there are additional benefits to STEM with CTE. Um, I've used the word CTE a couple times. For those of you who don't know what that means, CTE is career technical education. Um, so it's 
really bridging the gap between career and education. So knowing what you want to do, getting that hands-on experience yes. and having it brought to you inside the classroom. And it truly just enables students to make a more knowledgeable choice when you're selecting your career. So when you go out and you do say, hey, I want to be a nurse, or I want to be an engineer, you know that you like coding if you want to be an engineer. Um, maybe you're interested in doing robotics and things like that. This is you. Okay. Okay, so one of the first favorite things that I loved about being a part of CTE, which as Caitlin mentioned before, is career technical education, is just some of the benefits that you get out of this. Um, it's not just STEM, you're also getting, there's the cohort, which is basically you're forming a little community, community that you're backing each other up, you're learning how to have respect for one another, you're also building that preparedness and readiness for life experiences and career experiences, even college. So it truly is a wonderful program when you're getting into an academy that offers a cohort, which any class that you're taking, you guys are gonna be in the English class together, the engineering example or biomed together, you're gonna be in the history, the math. You are working with these same people throughout the day, but you're also gonna be doing that when you get into a career, college, um, just life goals and experiences. So it truly is a great program and it just provides you with so much learning and overall accomplishments. Yes, so it's like a school within a school. Yes. So that's what she means when she's saying that it's cohorted. So you have your main classes that you're gonna to go to, which are like your pathways that you're interested in. And then when you go to your core classes, the math and the history, you stay. So there's that extra support of students who are working side by side on a daily basis. Maybe you're in band and you have to get away for a little while. And then you have somebody like, if me and Kathleen were in class together, I could be like, Kat, what did I miss? I wasn't here yesterday. Exactly. And she knows, so it's that extra support that helps you get ready. Really wish I knew this when I was in high school. Yes. So, and then we're gonna show you guys a slide for the careers through the STEM organization. So Ooh. when you take advantage of the college and career prep inside the high school, there's HOSA, which is um, a national organization, and then there's Skills USA. So HOSA is everything healthcare. Um, so anything, any of the medical academies that you guys are in, um, maybe there's dental assisting that's available to you that you guys are interested in, those will all be HOSA, and you compete nationwide against students learning and preparing in the in the same skill set that you are and then skills USA is everything skills so it's practically everything else um, skills USA is going to be anywhere from automotive maybe maybe you take an auto class to learn um, engineering anything that requires a skill set would be skills USA and it's the same thing you go to compete against kids nationwide um, from all different states from all different school districts and you're just really able to um, network with each other and compete and show off all of your skills. And it's a lifetime experience. Yes. Okay, so we are going to open up for Q and A. If anybody wants to have any, if anybody has any questions, comments, anything they were curious about or wanting to know about STEM or the benefits or possibilities of what you can do within the programs. Perfect. So I have a question. So say you're. A middle school student how do you get involved in something like the pathways or the cohorts how does a student get involved with that at their high school so that's a perfect question so the middle schools are starting to incorporate stem programs um, when you're starting in the seventh and eighth grade but when you go to sign up for registration through your high school district um, the high schools are going to come out to the feeder schools which are going to be the middle schools and they're going to let you know which programs the high school district specific to you offers and then um, you can ask questions maybe you already know what you're interested in and um, when you sign up for registration you will select which programs you're interested in and then your classes will be based off of the pathway that you choose and when you're registering that's the key time to that if you're not aware of what programs are offered at your high school that is the key time for you or your parents to ask what programs do you guys offer and is it an academy a pathway or just a cte class perfect let's see if we have any more questions okay can you do any of this through elementary school so we specifically work for the high school district. Um, 
So I don't know for sure what exact programs, but like I said, STEM is being incorporated into middle schools. I do have a little girl that is in elementary school right now, and she does have the option to do robotics, which robotics is STEM. Um, and then um, as well as there's a... I think there's like a health option that's available to the younger kids. But go to your guidance offices, yes. ask your counselors that are on there and ask if there's any way, even if it's not an actual course that you take in middle school because you may have just the one teacher that teaches everything, um, it might be an after school program that you could take advantage of. Yes, and then also too, you figure what the more support STEM gets, the more possibilities. Because like we said, it's expanding on to junior highs. I have a son that's also in a junior high right now, and he is in a STEM program at his junior high, with which is engineering. Um, but the more support STEM gets, maybe there's a good possibility that we can expand to elementary school. But we're not there yet. But as of right now, we're already moving towards junior high because they were seeing the possibilities already as it was in high school. So if we keep pushing it, keep moving forward and p keep being interested and wanting to get involved, hopefully we'll get there. I would surely mm -hmm. love for my elementary kids to be in. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you guys for that. Um, another question. Do I need a STEM diploma to work in a STEM job? So not a STEM Diploma. So depending on the course that you choose, so let's say you decide that you want to do um, the fire tech program that they offer you. You might be CPR certified. Um, there will be a, which certificate do they get? There's a certificate that you get There's when you... It just depends on the program. There's a certificate that you guys get, but it does open a bunch of doors for you. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, like there are schools that offer education and you do receive some type of experience and certification, just letting people know that you have received that. So then when you do go and apply for a job, you have that experience, you have that background and the job that you are looking into will acknowledge that. And also like, look at that, like they already have experience. It's not someone that we're just training from the ground up, they already have experience, they already know what they're doing. Same with the law ones, or like Caitlin said, the public service, medical, engineering. When you guys are graduating schools, if it's an academy, you guys are graduating with a certification and then you guys are being acknowledged as graduating as a graduate of engineer or medical or whatever right. um, that it may be. But so it's a high school diploma, yes. but then also you do internships. When you're in the academies, you're able to do internships at a hospital, um, at a place of business, wherever it may be. So when you go to interview, you've already worked with the people interviewing you. And so then, it gives you a head start. Yeah, and then sometimes doing those, in those internships, that ends up turning into a job. Yes. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, and then Kelly, she asked, why do we have to worry about college when we are so far away from it? So even if you're not looking, so the benefit of STEM, even if you're not looking to go to college, which we always encourage college, just because there's so many beneficials to going to college. But if you're not, a STEM experience, it opens so many doors. Even if you don't go to college, we've had so many kids that straight out of high school that have gotten jobs at Northrop mm -hmm. or in a hospital or you know for a medical office depending on what they're going into or working you know for the ambulance services but again they did stem so they got the experience that they needed to be able to do that and they didn't go to college for that so it just depends on the kids stem is just overall beneficial you have to complete high school either way around let's do, add on some benefits that will also help you succeed in life. Right, and again, these are career technical education programs. So STEM and CTE work hand in hand. And like she said, with you getting the experience, maybe you do decide, I wanna join the military when I get out of high school, or I just wanna go straight into the workforce. You are having the hands-on experience built into your college education so that you're ready to start your career at the end of it. Exactly. Perfect. So you mentioned hands-on. Are there any actual hands-on classes that the students can participate in? Oh my gosh, yes there is. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> this Perfect. is her bread and butter. Perfect. Go ahead, go for it. Like I said, I wish I kn knew about this when I was in high school. This is awesome. So engineering, oh my gosh, they have so much hands-on experience. There's the solar car, there's the drones, there's robotics. They are hands-on experience. You are having to build these things for yourself, work on these things for yourself. Medical, there was in the paper about how some of our medical kids have helped support for CPR services on a football field because there was an incident that happened. Hands-on experience and they're getting the training in the class as well. They have to know how to do this stuff in order to be certified. You know, then we have the ambulance service at another high school and they're getting this hands-on experience. They're learning the fire department stuff as well. So you're getting this hands-on experience. You are learning firsthand on what you have to do. And the fire department one as well also goes to the fire station training area. And they also train there with actual firefighters as well. Yeah. So ultimately, you guys just want to take advantage of whatever high school district you're in. Look into the CTE programs that they offer. See what academies and pathways are available to you. Um, because the possibilities are endless and yes. we just we can't stress it enough that this is so beneficial for you no matter which way you want to go even if it's not stem you're interested in and you want to do something else there's just so many options available to teach you yes. exactly what you want to do and then just the benefits you get out of this we've had so many kids that they might have went for engineering but they did to something totally different or medical something yeah. totally different like i actually hate vomit i don't want to be a nurse anymore <laughs> But they know that because they've done it. We have several kids who have done the Health Careers Academy through all four years of high school, and they get out, and they're like, that was an awesome experience. I have lifelong friends, but I don't want to do anything in the medical career. And that's the point. It's better to figure it out now instead of spending years, time, money in college yes. for an education on a um, specific career that you're not even interested in. There was that one young lady that we met with audio engineering, and she graduated oh, yes. with the medical yeah. CTE certification yeah. and she Not works for the Dodger Network now. Exactly. <laughs> she, does, audio she does media. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I can tell how both of you are super passionate about what you do. So what persuaded you to choose the career that you're in right now? So I started off with the district and I actually worked in the attendance office um, and it was just building that rapport with the students and I started to see that really I was interested in that hands-on experience working directly with the kids, um, helping them succeed. When they win, we all win, right? Because kids are our future. And so I was really passionate about that and then when I found out about the different career technical education programs we offer, I wanted to hop on board and be able to promote. Uh, we actually have the, we have the ability to get internships for the students. Uh, we work hand in hand with the coordinators that are offered in the programs. Uh, we work with the kids, we work with the parents. So I just really felt like I could put myself to use better doing something like this than telling you you were tardy for class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is with our district. And mine yes. was a little bit more personal. I worked with the district for 12 years now. Actually, a little bit more now, oh my gosh. Um, but I actually originally worked with um, sped children and for me on a personal note uh, my son is also autistic and I really feel and seeing my son seeing my students and what they can do what their capability is I really wanted to see this be available for all kids so I'm very much um, motivated by driving this out for all kids because they all kids can benefit from this even ones that some people don't think they can they truly can yes yeah, kids from all different backgrounds can take advantage of these programs. Don't ever think that you have to have, you know, you have to be extra good at school or be really, really smart. I mean, there's there's ways that can assist you and you can you can have a 504. There yes. was a student with a 504 plan that just means that learning is a little bit harder for him yes. and he excelled in this program. He loved the structure of it. Which, because so. some of the learning that they do based with STEM, it actually is based off of STEM and if they succeed in STEM, the education, whether it's English, history, or things like that, especially on the cohorted programs, it really helps them understand things a little bit better just because they're seeing it with different eyes and different... Yeah. Eyes. yeah. And they're connected. It's, it's yes. a great support system. Well, I think that is all the time that we have today. Thank you guys so much for joining us and letting all the students know that there's different opportunities out there just rather than just engineering. There's also the fire tech and all the different programs that are offered through the Annal Valley High School District. Thank of you course, guys so much. Thank you for having us. And whoop whoop, STEM. <laughs> <laughs>